first question on episode 12 of 15 questions with the pop feminist is what is your name and what is your role in the in the reproductive health activism space so my name is natalia fernandez i go by nat uh, pronouns is are she her and yeah i'm so excited to be here <laughs> when did you first get involved in this space yeah so i first became involved in this space during um, the year 2020, a pretty iconic year for a lot of people. And uh, essentially, um, through this action accelerator that was brought on by One Young World, um, I, I made my organization into reality. And I was having so much great support in order to create my organization, period, which transforms, empowers, and educates those that bleed. And... Could you tell us a little bit more about this organization period? Yeah, so, you know, it really became um, my solution to a lot of the suffering that I had gone through myself. So I have premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And for those of you that don't know what PMDD is, um, which is what premenstrual dysphoric disorder stands for, it basically is a very debilitating uh, chronic illness in which you are not yourself for two weeks out of the month. So essentially, that is during your luteal phase. So it's those two weeks leading up to your period that you can feel symptoms of like depression, anxiety, irritability. Um, you can even go so far as having very intrusive thoughts, suicide ideation. So, you know, it's a really, really big issue and not a lot of people um, know about it. And so that's why it's so important to talk about it. So I created period with the idea of just creating awareness around PMDD and to share my story. And from there, it went on to something so much bigger. And and thankfully, you know, I have a dad as an MD, um, you know, he used to be an OBGYN, specializes in um, natural fertility. And so um, seeing all of his uh, success with functional medicine, which is also known as root cause medicine, I learned that there was so much to discover within more integrative ways of healing. And so that's what I did with period as I continued to advocate in this space. I was like, okay, well, what can I do to really help instead of just uh, keeping people stuck with the suffering, right? So I essentially, uh, you know, in my journey, I also became a functional medicine certified health coach. Uh, I also uh, created a lot of programs targeted towards people that want to get off of birth control, but are scared to or don't know what's going to happen. Um, people that want to heal more holistically from PMDD. Um, I also got a diagnosis of endometriosis recently too. And that has been a really big uh, journey for myself because it hasn't just been the mental, right, but also the physical that I've had to address and as those things affect all aspects of our health and wellness. So yeah, so, you know, period has been such a great, uh, you know, a great like leverage for me to really transform uh, my, my illness into wellness and to ultimately like understand and feel like what it means to truly be well. Wow. And what has been the biggest challenge you faced so far in terms of both like identity and reproductive health issues? Yeah, so, you know, I would say in terms of identity, uh, there's so many layers to identity, right? Uh, I think the biggest thing for me, starting off, like being a Cuban American, like first generation Cuban American, uh, you know, mental health isn't really seen as something that is real, like at all in Latin countries, like now it's starting to pick up traction. But, you know, typically, um, in conventional medicine in Latin countries or Spanish speaking countries, um, it's just not a priority. And so and so that was, you know, one of the hurdles that I've kind of uh, face in the very beginning of trying to um, not gaslight myself, right? And to, to try to recognize my own pain and recognize my own suffering. So, so I would say in terms of identity, it was really me <clears throat> being able to separate myself from the pain and understand like this pain is temporary. This pain is, uh, you know, not me. These feelings are not me. 
and and there's something that I have to process and then let go of. So so that's been a big, I would say, like kind of hurdle for me, but also just as a female entrepreneur, you know, like we second guess ourselves so much and it's like, what the heck? why can't I have the audacity of a cis white man? Like, what the, heck? you know, I was like, like, I want to, you know, like be, you know, storming up those boardrooms, you know, taking names, you know, getting those investments and things like that. But it was a big part to understand that I had a right and I had a space and I had a seat at the table to, um, you know, be educated in this, but then also to, to advocate for the business aspects too. So yes, yeah, so I'd say uh, those parts of my identity yeah, has definitely grown. So if you faced any like obstacles and maybe people understanding this as an issue or. Yeah, so I would say obstacles that I faced within the industry. A lot of people, it's kind of like my position, I've been pulling at from two different angles. So the angle of functional medicine. So a lot of people in functional medicine, right? Because it's like alternative, it's integrative. So they know about gut health. They're absolute experts in gut health. There's absolute experts in, um, you know, histamines and things like that. But there's not a lot of conversation still about premenstrual disorders. And now there's some conversations, right, about menstrual disorders too, like endometriosis, um, polycystic ovary syndrome. But I've really had to like advocate and connect the dots in functional medicine that not a lot of people are like spokespersons for that are experts in the field that are MDs. And then also in this aspect of, you know, being an advocate in the PMDD space. So, you know, I, I've connected with a lot of organizations and I'm so grateful to have like the opportunity to partner with the International Association for Premenstrual Disorders when I was a patient insight panelist. And so, uh, but what I've recognized in these spaces and not even just the organization, just the people that know that they have PMDD, they are so stuck in their suffering and like they are in such darkness where sometimes it's really hard to like get across to them, you know, because if you say, oh, I'm healing myself, like I'm doing great. They're like, what? Like you're doing something naturally, like that's a bunch of woo woo, whatever. And it's like, but you know, there's actually science that backs what I'm doing and 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 it shows why it's effective, right? Um, but again, it's just kind of, there's a lot of naysayers and a lot of people that are so attached to their suffering. And you know, everybody's in their own health journey, right? Like, so no judgment, there's no trying to like force of like, you should do this. Like you should listen to your body at all times. But yeah, it's been a big, uh, you know, obstacle that I've had to overcome of just recognizing and understanding like as much as you want to help people not everybody wants to actually be helped a lot of people stay with the pain because it's comfortable because the pain has served them for some reason you know so so yeah it's been it's been a part of my maturation <laughs> I would say as a as an advocate in the space wow that's that's really profound um and kind of just on that school of thought, can you evaluate the importance of more holistic education or holistic technique in reproductive care? Yeah, absolutely. You know, so one of the things that I gathered from my functional medicine education uh, through my coaching program, also, you know, just through uh, personal mentorship through my dad in that time and now as well, is that when we look at like medications, right, it's, it's again, solving the symptoms. And so when we think about fertility, when we think about reproduction, right, it's like, we have these, uh, these problems, but the medication, like, you're not going to get pregnant, right? If, if you don't know, um, sorry, my uh, little ding a ling a ling. <laughs> I thought I put it on do not disturb. Anyway. Um, okay. You can cut that edit it. So, <laughs> so anyway, so um, so basically what I've learned through fertility and through reproductive health, because it's all connected, right? Like you can't just say like PMDD is about mental health and we're just gonna focus on mental health. Like it has to do with your reproductive organs, you know, it has to do with your menstrual health, with your menstrual cycle. 
And so that being said, it's just so important. It's so, so important that we really listen to our bodies and what it's telling us. It's like, why don't we feel safe, right? Like if we look at the chakras, right? Ways of, of understanding our body on different energetic levels. If our root, right? If our connection to the earth, if our connection um, to, to the rest of our body is blocked, there's gonna be a problem, right? You're not gonna get pregnant if you don't feel safe, if you're not in the right environment. So, so, and going back to why holistic health is so important is because all these medications that doctors are prescribing you, right, it's going to solve the symptom. And unfortunately, I've had to learn through my own healing journey, my own health journey that, uh, you know, birth control had served its purpose in my life, right? And it serves so many purposes for so many, like, everybody's on their own journey and power, to, all the power to them. However, it was for me to learn like, oh, wow, well, now I have all these vitamin deficiencies. Now I have all these uh, troubles with my gut microbiome, right? So it's just like empowering people and educating them on what these medications do on a long-term uh, you know, perspective of their health. Because if they don't know what the long-term effects are, right, then they're just they're just in the present, they're in the now. And and you know, if they want to get pregnant later on, if they want all of these other things to do to happen in their lives, it's just really important to provide the resources and the education so that that person can make the decision that is absolutely best for their bodies. And unfortunately, when people go to the gynecologist, right, um, you don't get that information when you make those decisions when you get that prescription so i'm always just you know so passionate about uh really advocating for education and to provide resources for people so that they just better understand what's happening in their bodies and what they want to change to live in their optimal vision of health and well-being wow and in what ways do the mind and like the whole body affect maybe that like concentrated area just like in your pelvis yeah you know so there it's so intricate like honestly it's been so cool to learn about all of the connections it's it's wild it's absolutely wild I would say in terms of like premenstrual and menstrual disorders um if you look at the psychosomatic explanations of it, right? So if you're looking more of the emotional uh, explanations, like why things in your past come up in your present as disease, this idea um, in, in yoga, especially as um, as I just finished a yoga teacher training in Himalayan Kriya Yoga, I learned that. And, and and before that, I learned it, but I learned it on a deeper, more profound level now where, uh, you know, Pain is essentially what needs to flow through the body. And, 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 and all that is is just energy. So if energy gets stuck in the body, then what happens is it creates disease. So when I talk about past experiences, how that comes up in the present moment, we can be talking about things like traumas, abuses, reoccurring stressful events in one's life. So, you know, things like... Um, if you if you had uh, experiences of um, of like abandonment, right? Or sorry, sorry. Actually, let's let's not do abandonment. Let's do uh, you had like some sort of guilt or shame, okay, around um, your period, right? That's a very easy connect the dots example. You store that in your inner thighs, okay, in that part of the body. And so what happens is when you bleed, a lot of holistic like menstrual wisdom workshops, they'll ask you like, what was your first experience when you bled the first time? And because that is an indicator of what your menstrual health is going to look like for the rest of your life. Because think about it, right? If you are feeling um, any shame around your period, right? You're like, oh, I want to hide it. Like, oh my gosh, I just got a stain on my trousers. Like I am, you know, my my social life is done for. Like all of these things, right? It's like we, we stress over it or we feel embarrassed or we feel like we can't talk to our moms about it because it's weird and like, ew, gross, right? Like these are the kinds of thoughts that happen and um, and this is a very like I guess PG example because it can get very dark um, in terms of ways that you know past stressful events or abuses can like come up in our present uh, state of health. But but essentially it's this idea that um, the way that we think about the way that we feel our periods very much 
uh, impacts the way that we bleed. And as simple as that, yeah. And and and, and a big thing that I I love to share is that you know menstrual health is an indicator of your overall health, right? So if our menstrual health is messed up, that doesn't just mean our reproductive system is messed up, you know? That means that our whole body needs to um, get to higher levels of health and wellness. Wow, and how do you think the state of the world today and like population culture affects individual health and like in what ways, i.e. levels of stress, attitudes, priorities, stuff like that? Yeah, you know, I think... <clears throat> it's really it truly is hard to live well <laughs> like just simply like boom it's hard it's hard um you know our our societies are not structured to allow for rest you know um in the first 3 days especially following you know an uh, ayurvedic principles of of living when it comes to your menstrual cycle you know you should be resting for the first 3 days of your period I could name not that many, you know, companies that say, yes, 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 you absolutely have to work from home, right? Because that's not even like possible for some types of jobs. Um, and 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 so anyway, so it's just, it's very, very difficult. There's a lot of toxins, toxicants that are in our food, that are in our uh, clothes, that are in our, you know, period products themselves. Um, and, 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 you know, the problem is that, even things like touching receipts, right? Like since I was like probably, like, I don't know, 14 years old, I stopped like wanting to touch receipts because my dad had told me that the the plastic that's on these receipts, right? It's so transferable onto your fingers and that plastic, you know, is, go is, is an endocrine disruptor. So by touching these receipts, like you're messing up your hormones, right? So endocrines, uh, you know, endocrine meaning, you know, your hormones, so it's just like these kinds of things where it's just like, it, it is a really hard because we don't, we have all these like products that aren't good for us, but also it's like this lack of connection and lack of support from our community. Um, and, and especially in the US, we live in such an, uh, a very like individualized society, um, very, you know, individualistic. And so it just becomes very hard to you know, be flowy and living in your feminine energy when that flow comes. And, and, and again, too, for the darker days leading up to the period. Um, so it's, it is really hard. I think people are just so busy and busy, busy, busy. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it's this aspect of having to, um, yeah, kind of go against the grain. <laughs> how does your identity and your own experience shape how you work and your own interest in the space? I would say that my identity and my work in this, like my approach to premenstrual health and menstrual health in general, it's very unique to myself, <laughs> you know, because this is all based off of my experiences, right? Like I've had to like go through the pain in order to heal it. And so I really, really value uh, putting a priority of of being intersectional when it comes to speaking about resources and things like that, because, you know, mental health needs to be intersectional. Absolutely. Right. Like everybody has different lived experiences. And and that being said, it's always been a priority to honor that difference. So I would say, you know, being a Cuban American, that's very much shaped my my approach to healing, but then also write my travels all around the world. Like I was an ex digital, I am an ex digital nomad. I've, you know, lived in a few countries before I became a digital nomad too. And so it's really just been important to me to honor these ancient wisdoms that I've experienced, right? Like living in Bali, visiting Dubai, Dubai, um, visiting India, where I see all these incredible, incredible, um, uh, people and 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 healers and and ways of 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 practicing medicine it's it's gorgeous you know and 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 we can't you know say that one thing is better than the other because if it works it works right so so i think it's always important to honor these differences and and to show people that are more skeptical right about the spiritual aspects of health um, I think I think that's why it's important to to connect the dots when we can when when modern science explains what ancient wisdom has been doing for thousands of years. 
And speaking of being a digital nomad, what role can you see technology and social media playing in this journey? Yeah, you know, I, I would say it's it's a huge role. It's a huge role. I absolutely believe in the power of technology, the power of, of, of the positive power of business. And I think that if we stay conscious, we stay responsible, you know, we can heal so many people because we can reach them so much, much more easily, right? And we can make it more accessible. So I very much believe that, um, you know, it's going to be hand in hand when it comes to healthcare, technology will always be there. And and we see that right with biotechnology, we see, you know, with with a lot of different innovations in, in the healthcare space. So I think that another, um, another point that I wanted to bring up is, is that when it comes to uh, social media, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of noise that it creates, unfortunately, and, and that's something to be aware of. And I think that's a big struggle for a lot of people, because then they just don't know who to trust. And they're just overwhelmed with so much information. But in the same way, like the reason that I found out that I had PMDD was through an SEO search, you know, I was literally, I was like, severe PMS. And then I was like, whoa, that's PMDD. Okay. You know, so, so yeah, so I just think like, we have to be responsible about it and we have to be increasing our awareness of ourselves as we step into more, you know, technical um, uh, endeavors, right? People that are developing these technologies, they need to be, uh, you know, very aware because if they're not aware, then they're just going to program the technology that's going to like mirror what's going on in their brains. And if their brains aren't like, if that isn't a neuroplastic brain, if there aren't some new neural pathways being formed on a regular basis, like, I don't really want to, I don't want to engage with the technology. You know what I mean? I guess that goes more into AI, but you get, you get, you get the essence. <laughs> Uh, what has been a pivotal moment of learning in your journey? Pivotal moment of learning. I would say, well, I would say two things. A big pivot was when I lived in Bali, I was exposed to uh, a lot of alternative medicine. I would say that that was a very big pivot for me because up until that point, I it was just like the more science-based uh, functional medicine approach. Um, and again, functional medicine, it can, it leans into a lot of different medicines, like, you know, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, right? Um, and, and so in Bali, I would say that was like a very, very, very big pivot for me, because I was like, you know, attending like cacao ceremonies, and I was, do, you know, doing kirtan, and like, I was doing, uh, you know, sound healing, sound baths, you know, going to these uh, beautiful waterfalls in Bali, right, where you where you get, um, you know, really cleansed and purified. So I would say that Bali living there for five months, like that was a massive pivot for me, massive, massive, massive. And in the same way, uh, my functional medicine coaching academy, uh, they are partnered with the Institute for Functional Medicine, and that unlocked so much for me. And I was really, really grateful that, again, you know, I had my dad, and, and he was just really mentoring me throughout the entire program, you know, connecting me to other resources. I was able to gather more information because I was able to talk about the information, not just from the knowledge perspective, but the experience uh, perspective, because, you know, my dad has like, you know, over 25 years of, of experience being a doctor. So, so it's really cool to, yeah, connect all the wisdoms and experiences and put it into one. And now I get to just share it with the world and, you know, form, form the knowledge in all these different ways. And how could you urge people like with all that you've learned now to kind of take that time we talked about how life can be stressful and overwhelming and just so inundated um to like step back and prioritize themselves yeah so you know as bleeders right as the menstruators uh we we so 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 much need to rest it is absolutely essential if we do not rest if we do not make it a priority right? What happens if we don't make rest a priority? Our bodies will do it for us. <laughs> so, so I think it's just really important 
to give yourself the time to rest and give yourself true rest, right? Not just like scrolling on social media. I know it's fun. There's a little dopamine hits here and there, but it's not going to be beneficial to restoring your body, right? So that means like getting enough sleep, like women and females, they need more sleep than men. <laughs> you know, like we're, we're just not structured in the same way. Like we're on a full uh, monthly hormonal cycle, whereas men are on a 24 hour period, right? So so that being said, it's just so important to always go back to your values, right? Like what are your values that you have and how can you live out those values? Because if you stay close to your values, that means that you're going to be living closer into nature, more into tune with nature. And when you do that, you recognize like, wow, like, you know, it's winter time right now for us in the Northern hemisphere, right? Like, that's so cool. But like, what happens in the winter time? So we rest, we recollect, you know, it's like all this energy that's in the ground. And, and we just have to honor these seasons of life, these seasons of our cycle. And so again, you know, going back to what we need to do, it can really just be as simple as like taking a bath, you know, putting some Epsom salts in there, like lighting some candles. It can it can also be, right, a little bit more intricate than that. It can mean looking at your diet and figuring out like, okay, like what foods are more supportive or less supportive for me? And then how am I going to make decisions that are going to better my health goals, right? So it's just like things like that. Like we can, we can do a lot, but, we, you know, it just starts with little baby steps. The floor question number 12, what does stigma mean to you? Stigma means shame. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any particularly entertaining like life stories as com connected to like the space? I would share that one interesting. Well, I think I've had a couple of interesting like you know period uh, um, stories <laughs> like uh, experiences. But one thing that I did want to share because it was like so life transforming for me. It wasn't funny, um, but. Uh, when I was living in Cuba, it was really, really, really quite incredible, the the experience I had there, because I had gone to Cuba, so, you know, right, Cuban-American, I um was in Havana for a month, I was in, like, this beach area called um Varadero for, like, three weeks, and then I ended in Santiago, so when I was in Varadero, and I was like, okay, I'm not going to bleed again, I can donate my pads, I did that, and then when I get to Santiago, uh, which is where my dad was born, uh, I got my period. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, like I literally like just got there. It was only a week left, but I was like, I got to do something about this, you know? And so it became, you know, this like, I recorded like a series on it on my um, organization's page. And it was just so wild. Like, like people, when I asked like, because I mean, I don't use uh, tampons, I use pads following more like Ayurvedic ways of bleeding. And so, but when I asked like, oh, do they like, do they have like tampons or things like that? And they're like, the the females, you know, a, a woman my age, my age, even a little bit older, she's like, I've never seen a tampon in my life. Like, like, I, I was, I was like, what? I mean, of course, you know, living in communism, right? Like this is this, I mean, I guess it, it makes sense. I guess it makes sense, but it's so not okay. And so anyway, so it became a really big mission of mine because I had to make it a mission to find pads in Cuba. And, you know, I did end up like, you know, I went to all these different shops and I ended up going to this like MLC store, which is basically like they have all these like imported goods from um, abroad and um, I was able to find after like I went into like all these places and there was maybe like some diapers and that's it and I was like oh my goodness and so many empty shelves and, and it was very eerie you know like I was like Ugh. and and so then when I finally like I was like you know what? I'm just gonna stop into this other one because there's so many like locations in the city of these MLC stores so I stop into this hardware store you know like it was like it was like a hard like there was literally like lawn mowers on the oh. on the window display and like tools and things like that and I'm like all right I'm just gonna check it out and then I you know I turn around the corner what do I see a whole wall 
build of hygiene products, you know? So there were diapers and things too, but then there were so many different kinds of pads. Of course, most of them coming from the same brand. And I think it was like from somewhere in Central or South America, I want to say. And yeah, and I think there's even one that was like a chamomile uh, or or some eucalyptus or something like that scented but I was like well I mean I don't know how it is in Central America with their period products I know what it's like in Spain because I've lived there but um, yeah I was able to buy them they were really expensive considering the Cuban person's salary oh. um, definitely not affordable for the Cuban people for sure um, you know, and so anyway, so yes, yeah, so this was a very big, uh, you know, experience for me and it opened my eyes up so much because I was able to feel for a second what it was to live in period poverty and it wasn't fun and it was stressful and it was hot, really, really hot. Santiago is known for being hot. <laughs> so, you know, you can imagine you're walking all over under the beating sun and you're like going to all these shops and you just want to like find a pad so you can finally just like relax and sit down. So yeah, it's a, it, was, it was a pretty eye-opening experience. Yeah. Yeah. If you feel comfortable sharing, what are your future plans of ahead? Do you have any exciting projects coming up? Yeah, so, you know, I'm doing a lot of restructuring with period. Um, one thing that I am excited about is uh, I've been wanting to get more uh like I wanted to get more offerings out there that made sense for people. And so I'm really excited that in the very near future, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be offering, um, you know, opportunities to work with me one-on-one -on -one, and there's going to be programs specifically for endometriosis, people that have endometriosis, specifically for people that have PMD, uh, specifically for people that have that are on birth control, they want to get off things like this. And it would integrate, uh, functional medicine, but also in the health coaching aspect to it too, but also like food plans that are functional and also integrating Himalayan and Kriya yoga. So for those of you that don't know, um, Himalayan and Kriya yoga is an energy kind of yoga. And this kind of yoga, it's very specific to um, this certain place in India. So I actually was able to like visit, you know, the ashram of where this like Himalayan Kriya Yoga came from, you know, because they were like in the mountains meditating and they were doing all these incredible, beautiful, sacred practices. And so anyway, so I have been using this, this form of yoga to help me in my own healing journey. And it is such a profound uh, and sacred uh, practice that I was like, well, I got to share this, you know, and I really have to step into, into my life purpose, which is to help other people, right? Like there's always the purpose to the suffering. Like, it doesn't mean that you're going to be an energy healer, but you know, we are healing ourselves. And, and I think it's really great that we get these opportunities to to evolve and to grow and to gather the wisdom and gather the insight and make it into something beautiful. So, so yes, yeah, so those are some of the things that are, that are changing with period that I'm really excited for. Cause now I, I'm living in San Francisco and I get to like, you know, finally uh, have a home base and, and a time zone that I can just work out of for good. <laughs> oh, wow. That's so exciting. I wish you the best of luck. Thank and you. our final 15th question is what are your words of wisdom? My words of wisdom. Don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> I feel like I had to tell myself this a lot. And still, I think that when people are uh, chronically ill, and that includes, right, premenstrual, menstrual disorders, I think that it is really hard to... Uh, it's, it's really hard to be in the journey, but also you're having to operate like everybody else in the world, right? And meanwhile, you have to like hide the suffering. And meanwhile, you have to, you know, have a cover on always, right? And and so I think like, just don't be too hard on yourself. Like you're working against a system, against a medical system that wasn't unfortunately created for you to live in wellness. It was made for you to be living in illness, right? And so so I just think that it's really important um, 
to show yourself compassion when you can, because, you know, at the end of the day, and, and science proves this, and obviously we won't go into all of that, but, you know, love really does heal. And when you show up for yourself and you give yourself compassion, you um, express love to yourself, that is where the healing takes place. Because it's never about the movement that you do. It's not about the food that you eat. It's the love that you put into that food that you give to yourself. It's the love that you gave your body through that movement. And that's how it's going to elevate your, your, your feelings and your state of health. So yes, yeah, so, you know, it's just going back, circling back to love, like show up for yourself and give yourself that love. And, you know, we're givers, a lot of us, and just, you know, remember to receive in that process. Oh, that's really nice. Um...